السلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته. إن شاء الله I will commence with a short recitation from the Quran for purposes of barakah. I've actually selected some verses which I felt were relevant. إن شاء الله. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم من ذا الذي يقرض الله قرضا حسنا فيضاعفه له وله أجر كريم يوم ترى المؤمنين والمؤمنات يسعى And I want to start off immediately 
by making a difference between a want and a need. What is more important, something you want or something you need? Can you tell me? Something you need. So if you are being a change or making a change, what is more important? Is it important to change what you want or what you need to change? You need to change. And if what you need to change is what you want to change, then you're heading in the right direction, inshallah. And if what you want to change is not what you need to change, then you have not prioritized correctly in life. So we need to understand, I don't mean to become technical, but it's a topic, when it was given to me, I tried to look into it and make something out of it, and subhanAllah, it's loud and clear, it stands in front of us. We are Muslimin. We have been blessed to be granted the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The uncontaminated word of the Creator. I made mention this afternoon when I spoke in this hall of how the Almighty protects a person who has the Qur'an within them. And we all have some portion of the Qur'an in us. I'm sure every one of us has Surah Al-Fatiha. The first Surah of the Qur'an, we all memorize it, don't we, inshallah? Then we have a portion of the Qur'an and... Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's right is to protect us. We have a right over Him to protect us for the fact that we have struggled or, stra or strove or we have tried our best to memorize and to protect that book. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to look after us and to protect us at all times. That having been said, we need to know that we have with it something great. Let's listen. لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنَةٌ لِمَنْ كَانَ يَرْجُ اللَّهَ وَالْيَوْمَ الْآخِرِ وَذَكَرَ اللَّهَ كَثِيرًا Indeed, for you, there is a shining example. We speak here of not only a role model, but someone whose entire life is upon such a high pedestal that he serves as an example in all the finer facets of life for all of those who would like to meet with the Creator and who are preparing for the Day of Judgment. If I am preparing for the Day of Judgment, I have an example in the life of the Messenger وسلم, may peace be upon him, I have an example to follow. And for this reason, whatever I say this evening will be connected to the topic. If you think it's not, jot it down and think about it later on and you will see how it's connected to the topic. This example of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, remember where he started. Who was he? He was faced with some of the most difficult situations from the very beginning when he lost his father prior to birth. That was extremely difficult. He was born an orphan. And then what happened? He lost his mother at a very early age. And when he was given just prior to that, to Halima to Sa'diya, the foster mother, or, you know, in the Arab world at the time, they used to send their children out in the open to be brought up in the natural environment to learn some manners and probably a little bit of the culture and what have you, maybe to read and write in certain cases, but even to be breastfed and so on, and to benefit from the pure air of the Badia, meaning, you know, the outskirts, not that which is the cities, but rather the towns or somewhere out in the desert and so on. When he had gone there, there were certain things that happened to him there, which were also quite negative. With that, he grew up, mashallah. Development of character and conduct from a very early age. Remember, whatever I am saying is connected to the topic. Development of character and conduct from a very early age. And as he grew up against all odds, he was known as a Sadiq al Amin, the trustworthy, the truthful. And that having been said, as he grew up, one day he was granted prophethood at the age of 40. We know the verses that were revealed to him. Ifara, read. He says, Ma'ana bitari. I'm not a reader. I don't read. Imagine honesty. Imagine if we had to tell someone here, Ikra, and they say, I don't read, I don't write. We, someone would, in our midst would probably look foolish. And people wouldn't like to admit that I don't actually know this, you know. Especially when you put on a pedestal. 
But he admitted, I don't read. Iqara, read. Again, the instruction came. Read again. The instruction came a third time. But this time, it was coupled with something. Bismi Rabbika Ladi Khanako. Read in the name of your Rabb who has created. So if you are to do something in the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it will be made easy for you. You want to effect a change? Start. Start now. Don't say, I can't. I'm not able. Do it in the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it will happen. And this is what we need to learn from the beginning. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that change happened at the age of 40, in such a way that he received prophethood from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and he changed completely within a few words. And Jibreel alayhi salatu wa salam, according to the narration in Sahih al-Bukhari and in many other books, he embraced the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and hugged him so tight until he felt he was being maybe strangled or maybe he was about to lose his life and then he was released. And that happened again and the third time. And this was after the revelation of these verses and thereafter he ran down the mountain and he went to his wife Khadija bint Khuwaylid radiallahu anha. He went to her and he asked to be covered. He felt cold, he was shivering, he was shaking. He says, Zammiluni, I'm sure we've heard this. We should have heard it at least. And he says, cover me. And she looked, she heard the story and she says, you know what? Kalla wallahi la Allahu abadan. Nay, it's impossible for Allah to let you down ever because you are a person who is upright. You have good character, you have good conduct, you have assisted the widow, you have done so much good, you have helped wherever you could, you are honest, you are trustworthy, you haven't cheated anyone. And she recited and mentioned all the good qualities of this man whom she had married. Now prior to that, the Prophet ﷺ used to watch the people of Mecca, and what he used to do is, he used to meditate and contemplate over their condition. Hey, this is very bad. These women are being traded. When a man dies and he owes somebody money, here comes the man and says, right, I need this girl and I need that ex-wife of his. Sorry, I'm not pointing at anyone in particular. The stairs. <laughs> it's actually the step there and the step there. I'm quite particular. Sometimes I point at the ceiling to make sure that there's nobody in particular that we're pointing at. So, he says, I need this woman and that one there. SubhanAllah. And they would be given those women as a payment for what they were owed prior to the death of that person. And this was idiotic to say the least. It was unacceptable. It was treating a female like a commodity. And this was just a little tip of the iceberg. There were so many other things. People used to worship idols made of tamar. Tamar is dates. And when they were hungry, they said, look, please give me food, give me food. When there was no food, okay, I'm eating you. And they ate. Omar ibn Khattab says that himself. He laughs and he says, there was an occasion when I ate a god I used to worship. Why? Because the food didn't come. It's a fact. So this was the type of brain that was being underutilized or wrongly utilized when we have intellect and it is channeled in the wrong direction, we will naturally face disaster because we will not be able to think purely. And this is why it's very important to be in the right environment and in the right company, inshallah, I'm going to get to that later on this evening. Be my shi'at in that, if Allah wants. So, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was contemplating, considering, thinking, and he was thinking of solutions. What do I need to do? And from this I want to go to point one. Point one, firstly we need to know that every single person, more so the Muslims, but I'm not only confining my statement to the Muslims, every single person, it is nature instilled by the one who created us, that at some point in your life, whether it is for spiritual reasons or for other reasons, we will feel the need within us to change. Something will tell us, I need to do something about this. Whether it is religious, and that in the case of Muslim is the overriding factor, Something will tell you, I need to start reading my salah. The sisters, something will say, I need to dress a bit more appropriately. Something somewhere down the line will click. Some people it clicks a little bit earlier, some it clicks later, some it clicks after a disaster happens in their lives, and some they do not wait for that disaster, but the change comes from within. But every person, believe me, even the non-Muslims, there comes a time in their life when they consider Islam. Believe me. 
There comes a time in their life when they consider Islam and they look at it positively for a split second, even the enemies. And I'm giving you evidence of Abu Jahl, Abu Sufyan before he accepted Islam, and the others who were the enemies of Islam who have confirmed that they used to consider this Islam even for a split second and something then told them not to or told them to go forward. So that is point number one. Every one of us human beings is gifted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you have the problem of procrastination in your life where you're lazy and you don't like to attend lessons, something within you says, hey, I better make a change. But sometimes there are certain negative things in society or around us that prohibit us from excelling in the right direction and sometimes there are positives around us that push us towards achieving what we are meant to achieve. Now at the time of the Prophet sallallahu what company did he have? He had the company of good people. Prior to Nubuwa, his friend was Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anhu. He was a good man and we know he was a good man. And he didn't drink and he didn't have bad habits even before Islam, according to some of the narrations. And the Prophet sallallahu never ever mixed with those who were bad. Rather, he preferred to stay on his own. Sometimes a question might come in your mind. I know a question, this question has crossed me, my, my mind as well, at some stage in my life. And I think, you know what? Am I right here? And everybody around me wrong? Or are they all correct and I'm wrong? Sometimes it happens because when you decide to do something correct, it should be based on something, based on knowledge, based on fact, based on something solid, and then the determination will make you achieve it for as long as you are not contaminated by the adverse negative environment around you, even if the entire globe feels what you're doing is wrong, and your own family starts with you saying, you put him on a scarf, like the nuns that I saw in the Presbyterian church down the road there. <laughs> even if your own family tells you that. Wallahi, well, you need to stand upright, steadfast, you need to know your goal, what you're trying to achieve, and believe me, what is right, will remain correct until Qiyamah, until the last day, even if the whole globe thinks it's wrong. That's one thing we need to know. And what is wrong remains wrong <coughs> up to the last day, even if the whole globe thinks otherwise. That's a fact. When we are weak, we get swallowed by people or adverse environment, whatever you want to say, we get swallowed by the negativity around us, not realizing that wallahi, if we have based what we would like to do on solid knowledge and we know now what we want to do, inshallah, we will be able to achieve it based on that which is solid. The minute your foundation is weak, as you're building the building, it drops. Then you start again, you don't realize, you're going to go back, dig the foundation and lay it once again and then you start afresh. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to open our doors. The reason I say this is, one of the first points is, Determine what you want to change. We're talking here about change. What do you want to change? I spoke about change in spirituality, but the truth is, we need to change many other things. Sometimes, and here we are in universities, and we're speaking to an audience of forces here, I think it's relevant for me to say, even in your studies, what do you want to do? Why are you here? What do you want to achieve? Remain focused and work hard to achieve it. Your parents or someone somewhere down the line is paying, in our slam, they say big bucks for you to be here. Well, why? It's a fact. Some people work day and night to have their sons and daughters in far off prestigious universities and they're having fun there. Is it, is it fair? So we need to know what needs to be changed. Admit it. Write it down, ponder, and this is why we have something known as meditation. In the Sharia, some people take it very far, and some people ignore it totally. I have a balanced approach, and what we say is, every day, consider your deeds. This is based on what Umar ibn Khattab anhu used to say, حَاسِبُوا أَنفُسَكُمْ قَبْلَ أَن تُحَاسَبُوا وَزِنُوهَا قَبْلَ أَن تُزَنُوا Take account of your deeds before they will be taken account of for you. Allah is going to take account of your deeds and naturally when you are at the university, if you do not take account of how you are spending your time in the university, come the day of exams and what happens? We start sweating. 
You know, we're all nighters. You know what an all nighter is? You don't study, you enjoy your life, and suddenly when exams come, we're popping in the pools and we're having the red bulls. Now, the red bull doesn't do anything, believe me. The chlorine in there is synthetic. That's what makes it halal, to be honest. If it was not synthetic, we would be saying something else. But even with that synthetic chlorine, the problem we have is it no longer has an effect. I know young boys here, I can see their faces, they probably have 12 and they're still asleep. Mashallah. Mashallah. Sorry, no offense, I'm also bad at that. So the reality is, we need to know that that is not good enough. We need to take account of our deeds and we need to also weigh our deeds before they will be weighed for us and then we're embarrassed. Why is this the case? If you take account of your own deeds, there is always room for improvement and you will be able to, to keep away or keep at bay regret. But when, when something is taken account of for you, sometimes it might be too late. It might be too late. If you are committing a sin, for example, and that is a point I've jotted down for tonight. Sometimes we know what to change, and inshallah I'm going to get to the other points, but you have a sin that is being committed that blocks that change. It stops it. These are called mawana. It's a mana. It comes in between yourself and the achievement of what you want. And it stands in the middle and glares you in the face. So you need to now prioritize. Something you want and something you need. And you need to know, if I'm going for something I want, and it clashes with something I need, I'm wrong, I need to knock this thing out, and then I will achieve. SubhanAllah. You need to breathe. SubhanAllah. You need to breathe. But at the same time, you want to be underwater. Allahu Akbar. So you either need to go down with a mask, and you need to have an oxygen tank, and know the time and all that, make a plan and go down. Because you need to breathe. You prioritize, or you simply don't go down, or you practice the technique of keeping your breath for as long as you need to be underwater. There you are. That's an example of water. But in our lives, it's exactly the same example. I need a change. And there are certain things I want in life. Well, why? Let me be honest with you. I tell the brothers who, who love to go for polygamous relations, I have two wives, alhamdulillah. But I do not encourage it, nor do I discourage it. I say, if your situation, if it fits in it, you need to know your wants and your needs. And you need to make sure you are not blowing away a beautiful marriage solely because you want something. Allahu Akbar. I hope I've made myself clear here. You want something, it might be halal for you, you can go to the, to the moon explaining to people that it's halal and it's jais and it's this and it's in the Quran. MashaAllah, we agree with you. But you're the only one who can answer the question, is it a want or a need? And are you going to lose your need in the process of achieving a want? Allahu Akbar. I hope I've said it very clearly. And I, I know the brothers are looking at me as though if they had eggs with them, I would be better. Allah, my beloved brothers and sisters in Islam, we know of the crisis in the Muslim Ummah. We are also bleeding with the Ummah, all of us. But the truth has to be said sometimes as it is. And I think this is something that fits with the topic. And if you want to know if I had planned to say this, the answer is no. It came to me a split moment before I actually said it. So, now let's get back to what we were saying. Rasulullah ﷺ thereafter, he got this nubuwa, he got the prophethood, and he got the encouragement of his wife. What that means is, once you identify what needs a change, you need to make sure you deal with like-minded people, or you go around the genuine people who can give you the proper advice and the real courage and the real support to achieve what you have to achieve in life, and to make that change that you need. So you need genuineness. So if, for example, you are deciding to elevate yourself spiritually, you need to be in the midst of those who are already elevated. And this is why I always say, it's very important for you to have a role model in life. And not just one role model, because we have a role model who is supreme, who is the Prophet wasallam. He is a role model in every aspect of existence. But, today, in our midst, we need role models. They will all be a role model for one department of my life. So, in that department, I have this person as a role model. In this department, I have that one. In this department, I have that one. I will only take this from that one and the others. I will excuse him or her because we're all human beings. Myself, for example, there might be some things you might take from me. And there might be other things you might not want to take from me. So there we are. 
We cannot have a single person whom we see and we say, you know what, this is my role model and that's it. Because sometimes they might give you advice that is detrimental because they have not excelled in every single field. The statement is very deep for those who want to understand. I know it's very late, but I told the brothers I have till 3 a.m. Alhamdulillah. <laughs> That's why they kept me right at the end. <laughs> so, if we know the Prophet ﷺ was supported by his wife, she then took him to Waqa bin Nawfal. What does that mean? We want to make a change, we know what it is, we know it has to come, we need to have the correct support, we need to learn about what is going on, what is happening. Education is extremely important. I touched on it moments ago to say you need to have the knowledge of what you want to achieve, what you want to change in your life. And I've told you, I do not want this to be a solely spiritual talk, but let's also put a flavor of the secular studies that we are engaging right now in it as well, because it's important a lot of you are not from Cardiff. And I'd like to hope that when you go home after your studies, you would be superstars in whatever field you are. But that's only if you have a vision. And that brings me to the next point. You need to always aim very high. Aim beyond the skies, and you will at least get to the clouds. SubhanAllah. But if you aim to the cloud, you might jump a little bit higher than that table. <laughs> yes. So aim very, very high, and start jumping. Start jumping. And when you jump, Initially, you won't even know how to jump. Do not be embarrassed of your few mistakes. Never. If you are embarrassed of a few mistakes that you make in the process of achieving the change, you won't change. What's going to happen? Oh, I don't even know. You know, there's a young boy, I was standing with him, and I have a habit. You know, we give people the opportunity to, to, to recognize themselves, because that is also a point that I've jotted down for tonight, to recognize yourself. If you take a look at the Facebook status that I put whilst I was in the foyer down here later, <laughs> earlier on in the afternoon. It's actually facebook.com slash <laughs> 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 The status is connected to this. You need to recognize yourself and never feel useless. The minute you feel useless, it's over. The game is over. You lead a depressed life. Everybody here is gifted. And believe me, in such a special way, you wouldn't even know. But search for it. Look, how am I gifted? And some are gifted in more than one way. Build on that, mashallah. Have people who can around you who can recognize that and who can help you build on it, subhanAllah. And this is why it's extremely important for us to know, to know that if we want to change, what exactly do we want to change? How are we going to change it? And in order to achieve that, we need to have the education, we need to have the know-how of this thing. How am I going to achieve it? Put your head down and go and achieve it. The point I was making is, Never be bogged down by a little mistake you've made. Get up. I was saying, I was in the midst, I was with a few boys and it was time for salah. They said, yeah, share, yeah, share, talk about yeah, share. And I looked at one of the guys, and he had a jeans on and a t-shirt on and so on, and I said, yeah, share. He said, no. I said, come on, eat the salah. He said, yeah. I said, why? Are you embarrassed of a mistake you're going to make? It's all the fatty hat. This is the opportunity to correct it, inshallah. And he said, it's only us, the four guys here, and we all know each other. You know, there's nobody to impress behind there. <laughs> so, he says, yeah, well, okay, not a problem. Wallahi, he led such a beautiful salah. Such a beautiful salah. And that's the day I told myself, I said, never underestimate someone. We had a singer from Pakistan called Junaid Jamshed. <laughs> And to be honest with you, he said something very touching, I'm going to touch a little bit on it, and I've said it a lot of times when I speak about it, because I think it's motivation. Do not underestimate the young boy in the nightclub, because that's where I was, that's what he says. Sorry, not me. <laughs> Pakistani cricket. 
And he accepted Islam, I think his name is Yusuf, Muhammad Yusuf, if I'm not mistaken. There was always a man called Saeed Anwar, or who was always prodding, saying, you, know, you should be a Muslim, come on, what's the, what's, the, what's the story, come on, look at your habits and so on, come on, let's go and teach you. And that little prodding every day made him think, and he started looking and watching, and he judged Islam for itself. You know, we say never judge a book by its cover. Believe me, I cry when I see good non-Muslims out there with brilliant habits. And I think to myself, Ya Allah, they, the only thing that is stopping them from Islam is a barrier that is created, either by them or someone else. Khalid ibn Walid radiallahu anhu was a powerful, intelligent man. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam watched this man in the battle of Uhud and in other occasions, on other occasions, and told his brother at some stage, where is Khalid? مَا مِثْلُ خَالِدٍ يَجْهَلُ الْإِسْلَامِ يَأْتِي بِهِ اللَّهُ Allah will bring him to this deen. A man as intelligent as Khalid will not be ignorant of the power and the correctness of Islam. And believe me, a few days later, he rolls up in Medina to Munawwara and he accepts Islam. And just, it's a very emotional story, I need to mention it for 60 seconds. Brothers, listen to what he says. He tells the Prophet I've done so much, I've killed so many Muslims, I've done this, I've done that, and this is what's happened, and that's what's happened. Now I'm going to accept Islam, people will retaliate. Rasulullah says, Ya Khalid, in the Islam ya ma qabla. He says, Do you know Islam will delete every bad you did? Now for your information, when you're a non when a person is a non-Muslim and they accept Islam, did you ever know that the good they've done carries through? It's only the bad that gets wiped out totally. So if we say, you're starting with a clean slate, we're wrong. You're actually starting far ahead of all of us here. Because you're starting with no sins at all, and all the good you did in your life is just carrying through. Wow, it's gone through. Allah does not waste your deeds. Someone might argue and say, I was not a Muslim, and I was this, and I was that. Believe me, what is deleted is that which is bad. There might be difference of opinion on this, but that's the opinion I agree with after studying what we've studied. Alhamdulillah. So we need to understand, Khalid ibn Walid says, Are you sure? Ala dhalik? And he made the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam repeat it a few times, that, Ya Khalid, inna l-Islam wa yajubbu ma qabla. Don't worry, everything is deleted. He raised his hands and he says, Inni ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna ka'abduhu wa rasul. I bear witness, this, that's correct. And there we are, he was embraced immediately, moments ago the enemy, and moments later, <coughs> subhanallah, an elevated status known as Sahabi, after his name we say, Rabbi Allah, may Allah be pleased with him, and that's all. So, that is another example. Another example that, I, that I'd like to give you is that of a rugby player of the All Blacks in New Zealand. You can Google him and have a beat. <laughs> his name is Sonny Bill Williams. I'm sure you've seen him. Sonny Bill Williams. I know in, in the UK a lot of people are not too keen on rugby. I played rugby for two years, so basically I would know. <laughs> not <a> joke, <laughs> so, this man, his life changed completely. He entered the fold of Islam. He didn't make a big issue out of it. I was with him a few months back in Cape Town, maybe a month and a half ago. And mashallah, we sat for so long and we were talking about how we accepted Islam in a nutshell. Everybody at some stage gets fed up with their lives when their lives are heading in the wrong direction. It is fitrah, it is nature that Allah puts in your heart. Even if you're a Muslim, you have a bad habit, you hooked on to zina, a day will come when you say, hey, this thing needs to stop. You hooked on to porn, a day will come, this thing needs to stop. What am I getting out of it? You hooked on to something bad, but never ever give up or think you're useless or think it's over or think Allah hates you or think you are a person who will never become right. No, that's when you lose. It's something you need to know. Allah loves you. That's why we see that yesterday. Wallahi, it's a fact. We need to change. The verses I read, Allahu Akbar. أَلَمْ يَأْنِ لِلَّذِينَ آمَنُوا أَن تَخْشَعَ قُلُوبُهُمْ لِذِكِّ اللَّهِ Has the time not come? Has the time not come? For the believers to humble their hearts towards the reminder of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Has that time not come? Allah is asking us, well when is it going to come? Today? Tomorrow? It might be too late. It's about time we soften our hearts. 
And it's about time we made that change. There are so many verses in the Quran that tell us change before it's too late. In Surah Az-Zuhr, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about how He forgives every sin that is committed. <coughs> and He says, never lose hope in my mercy. So to lose hope in the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is actually falling into the clutches of the devil and shaitan. And Allah says, don't allow that to happen to you. But turn before it is too late. <coughs> They had racism, they, they, they didn't want him, 
they had this hierarchy business, they didn't want to give up their power, they didn't want to, all these things, so Allah kept them away. They didn't have sincerity. So we would also require sincerity when we want to change. That's another point. Without sincerity, the proper change will not come in. We will change for the wrong reasons. So what should we be changing for? Primarily, for the pleasure of the Almighty as Muslimin. And thereafter, to achieve something greater for the benefit of ourselves and those around us, including the non-Muslims. Including the non-Muslims. And then, inshallah, we will be able to change in the right direction. Why I say including the non-Muslims is because no matter what we study, whether it is religious or secular, as Muslims we are taught that it is very selfish to keep it to yourself. The Prophet says, anni Convey from me even a little message, a short part of a verse that you know. Give it away. So you've learned it, you have it with you, don't keep it there. You give it to someone else, Muslim and non-Muslim. And you give it to them. The same applies if you are, if you become, for example, a doctor, what will happen? You either come back to teach, you become a professor, or you go out to practice in the field. They will be from amongst your students or from amongst your, your patients, those who are not Muslim. The way you dish out what you've learned at varsity out to them will determine their whole outlook towards Islam. And it will bring them towards that. And if it doesn't, it will at least bring forth the outlook towards whatever it was, dentistry or whatever else it was. If you were a dentist, whatever it is, sometimes if you're a very, very good person, it might motivate someone to do the same, to do what you did. And this brings me to another point. There is a stage in our lives when we need role models, yes, every day. This one is my role model and that one and that one. And I compartmentalized it for you moment, uh, moments ago. But I'd like to say that there comes a stage when you are going to have to ask yourself a question. It's no longer who I want to be like. It's like, are there people who want to be like me? Yes. You now need to become a role model for others. And my dear sisters, if, if some of you, I'm sure you might already have some children, some, but the bulk of you are probably students who are not even married. The day you marry and have a child, believe me, it is a God sent child who already looks up to you as a role model from day one. You are in their eyes, in that initial stage, infallible. In their eyes. You are the mom. You know, on a very, very light note. They say when you look up to your dad when you're young, that dad makes no mistakes, nothing at all. And ten years down the line, you, down the line, you hear him burp, mashallah, loud. Uh, <laughs> is that my dad? Wow. For your information, I've given the better example, <laughs> To be honest with you, why I say this is because, mashallah, that dad was at least 10 years later, they figured out he's just a human being. <laughs> mashallah. The reason I say this is how many dads are actually living by proper role models and they have children who follow them in their cigarettes, in their ways, in their habits, and in their F's and B's. That doesn't stand for faces and books. <laughs> <laughs> so we need to notice that they watch us and they see us. And they watch the signs and they watch the actions. Wallahi, I tell you, there is a hadith of the Prophet وسلم, speaking of salah. And he says, You instruct your children to fulfill the salah when they are of the age of seven. When they are of the age of seven. And what this would mean is, prior to seven, it is not the sunnah to instruct your child to read salah. But it does not mean that your child should not be reading salah. Rather, that child should be looking at you and following by example. Which means, when the child is one year old, and they see the mom going in sujood, they will fight to get into sujood. Your little daughter will fight to put on the scarf, but you've never spoken to them. Man, I need one like yours. <laughs> Dad, where's my beard? <laughs> what about me? What about me, I'll tell you. My son tells me, let's go to the shop and buy it. Nobody spoke to my daughter or anyone else's about the scarf 
of that age. They want it because that is the power. You have been made into an automatic role model. By the time you have children, make sure that you have that quality. Inshallah. And this is why we say, yes, we do have role models at this stage, and we will always have role models, but there comes a time when you have to become a role model. Now, let's get to a few other points. I know I'm probably running out of time, but to be very honest with you, you are going to have to forgive me today. All these notes, all these notes to be very honest with you, will have to be excused. <laughs> Do it, you know, what's going to happen over? 
Wallahi, there might be some non-Muslims. I give you an example of what happened to me in Zurich at the airport. We wanted to read Salah, and I was with my dad. Mashallah, man with a beard. You know, we, I was also actually looking just what I look like now. <laughs> and they asked for a little place, and we were reading our Salah, and we didn't even ponder for a moment. Why? Uh, you know, that, oh, there's a lot of people passing. We found a nice corner, put our bags, and we started reading Salah. Believe me, there were at least about 10 to 15 people who had stopped and waited and watching. And a lot of them were women. <laughs> and they were just watching. And when they finished, wow, it's the first time we've seen this. It looks so serene. <laughs> the only position that I could actually have got into, where my brain is lower than my heart, so the oxygenated blood actually gets there so quick, so that when I get up, I can think. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we need to have, not just typical, it's in the Quran, we've got to read five times a day, and that's it. But why they don't believe in the Quran? They have nothing to do with it, and that's such an abrupt answer. And that brings me to another point. We will not be able to achieve correct change if we haven't changed our character and conduct correctly. We need to be people, wallahi, who have good character and conduct. I have met a sister, with all due respect to sisters here, who was properly, Islamically dressed, completely Islamically dressed, and her attitude let off a stench. <laughs> wallahi, to be honest with you, you know, entering the supermarket, the attitude, wow, how she spoke to the people, no. I looked and I said, ah, my sister, please, you are an ambassador of Islam more than me. Whatever you say here gives the picture of Islam to all these people. If you want to change yourself and others, this is not the way. Allahu Akbar, please. She looked at me. And she knew me. She says, you're not supposed to be talking to me like this. <laughs> there you are. Typical. And I, I went away without, well, I achieved whatever I wanted to, but whether it affected her there or later, I don't know. But what I mean is, it developed, you know, we don't hate people, but we hate the actions of the people. We don't hate a drunkard, but we hate the drinking in him. If we get rid of that, mashallah, he might be a brilliant man. We don't hate a man of drugs, but we hate the drugs that he's on, mashallah. I hope you understand what we're saying. You know, we need to distinguish and separate between the person and the habit. Because, and I, I said this in a lecture, when was it? Today? Yesterday? Last night? In Brighton? I, I, I've even forgotten where I spoke and what I said. But anyway, the truth is, what I did say, we were speaking about how important it is not to hate a person solely because of their habit, but you hate their habit. Because, who doesn't have a bad habit? Put up your hand. Well, maybe that hand didn't have a bad hand. <laughs> so the truth is, we all have some bad habits, some are minor and some are major. If we were taught to hate people because of their bad habits, none of us would have been here because we'd be hating each other. Common sense, logic. So when we want to change, we can change one thing at a time or we can change a few things, but we will never be able to change absolutely everything. And this is why life is a challenge. I always say, the sisters, the brothers, as you develop in life, you come closer and closer to the Almighty, you get to know more and more, and you become higher and higher in your field secularly as well as Islamically, until you meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala upon the best condition. And this is what we need. So now, in order to round up, inshallah, I'd just like to mention a few points. Uh, firstly, we need to interact a lot for the right people. Interaction is very important, and let's just not close ourselves and, you know, cocoon ourselves into a little corner, because to mix, to air our views is very important. To say what you feel is correct, on condition that you substantiate it respectfully with that which is correct. Because someone says, look, I don't agree. That is a very, very, should I say, let me try and choose a good word. It's a very stubborn statement. I don't agree. But if you mention, you know, brother, let me tell you. If you do it this way, I think this is what will happen. And if you do it that way, possibly that's what will happen. They say, oh yeah, that's right. You know, it's like dealing with a person who are, who's suffering from a, psycho, a psychological disease, maybe schizophrenia or something. If you use the word no with them, they might pounce at you. You can't use the word no. So you use the word yes. He says, I want to kill that guy. So, yeah, good idea. <laughs> but, but I tell you what, 
why don't you really leave that for tomorrow morning when the sun comes up? You know? He says, oh, yes, it will be brighter, you'll be able to see. We're just talking a whole lot of nonsense. We want to buy time. Now, buy the time, he said, yeah, because you're on his side. See? Now, when you're on his side, and I'm speaking facts, this is how you operate with these other people, between now and tomorrow, you've got a mission to convince him not to do it. But without using the word no. So then you've got to go to him and say, you know what? If anything goes wrong, it's going to be really a disaster. So why don't we just try and talk to him and get him onto our side? He'll be our man. He will? Yeah, he will. Okay, let's go and do it. <laughs> the reason I give this example is because there was a stage when I had to tell a number of school teachers, and sometimes even spouses. You know, wife comes complaining about the husband, and I say, you're a doctor. You deal with patients. You have so much, so much patience. They pay you to be patient with them. Treat him like a patient. Mashallah, everything will be well. <laughs> you know, you're ready to spoon feed the patients and write for them. Do this at home and do that. Well, your husband back at home. Obviously, this is an example on a lighter note. But sometimes you've got to give these examples for people to think. We're ready to do things for some. That Wallahi, if we had to do those things to the right people, our lives would really blossom. The example of an air hostess. You know, once, several years back, there was this woman who had such a broad smile and she presented the food in front of us. Ah. And I looked, I said, I wonder if she gives her husband the same smile. <laughs> well, why? It's a fact. So, if she had shown out of 32 teeth, even 16 to him alone, the problem would have been solved. <laughs> we don't think of it sometimes that way because we've never looked and identified at the changes we need to make in our lives. We look at what we want to make, and we don't look at what we need to make. Inshallah, there are certain things that we need to prioritize. And this is why I say, my beloved brothers and sisters, what is of utmost importance is to change the way. And when I say to change, I'm talking of positive change. We never talk of negative change. To change the way we've been treating our parents, our siblings, our children, our spouses, to start. <laughs> Oh, you who believe, save yourselves and your family members from the fire. The reason I read this verse is to show you where the circle commences. Many of us are so good with others outside that come home, mom means nothing. Phone her this evening. Tell her, mashallah, we had a good talk. Wallahi. Tell her how much you love her. It is an ibadah, it's an act of worship as Muslim mean. We haven't done that. We think, oh, mom, she gave birth to me, and now I'm a big boy, I'm a big boy. <laughs> <laughs> it's a fact, that's how we think. And then sometimes our spouses, I know of people and men, I know of men, subhanAllah, who are so good to the ladies, I said, ah, sorry, you dropped that, can I carry you? <laughs> and go home and say, make me a cup, that's it. <laughs> There we are. And the same applies to our children. Sometimes we're so good with other people's children and comes to our kids, come to our kids, we, we're busy reprimanding them in an unacceptable manner. It happens. And this is why I had to make mention of our parents, our siblings, siblings meaning brothers and sisters. Wallahi, it's not worth keeping that little rivalry that was there from the young age. No, cut it. Phone them and say, you know what? I don't want to tell you anything, I just want to say, I love you, you're a part of me. Salaamu Alaikum. Wallahi, that's a change, that's how you start the change. It will make them think they might not sleep that night. Wallahi, it's a fact. What happened? They're driving back at 3 in the morning, was that you? <laughs> I'm trying to give you some practical lessons to show you how a change starts and never ever let your pride stop you from changing. Sometimes a change is waiting. You know, like the signs of Qiyamah, I was speaking about the signs of Qiyamah on, on a program on Channel Islam a few days ago, and I spoke about how the hadith of the Prophet he says there is a, like a string with all these, you know, like a necklace, and as it's broken, everything comes down, everything comes down. MashaAllah. One after the other, all the beads drop. Sometimes we need to know that our chain of change is sealed. You need to open it up and let it drop out. And sometimes that is just because we were too proud to say, I'm sorry. It was my mistake. It was my mistake, I'm sorry. 
Even if it wasn't my mistake, what am I losing by saying, you know what, I'm sorry. I apologize. I really am sorry. Because we cannot continue in life holding baggage that is unnecessary. I give the example of baggage on a plane. We make sure. Going to London, 23 kgs. Weighing five, six times. Are you sure? Okay, take that book out. Okay, the other book out. Okay, 22 and a half. Now that's fine, let's go. And we're not worried about the other weights which we're holding in our hearts, which are bogging us down from the plane that is going to take us into Jannah. Allahu Akbar. We need to change that. And this is why the last point that I'd like to raise. Remember, I've given... In fact, I've thought of something. You know, it said 10 minutes. And now it says 7 minutes. If that was 3 minutes, then my shout was 7 minutes. <laughs> Thank you.